Hi, I'm Dan Weisey with the Lessman Instrument Company, and I'm a product support guy here at Lessman. We're going to talk today about why DP, or differential pressure flow measurement, is still such a valid technology in the 21st century. So welcome to the DP flow measurement for the 21st century. Let's just review DP flow measurement for a minute here. DP is a volumetric flow measurement for gases and liquids, and with the right transmitter you can actually infer a mass flow measurement. By definition, you have to have a primary flow element, which is the, which is the element inside the pipe, and it creates a pressure drop. That pressure drop is read by a differential pressure or a multivariable transmitter. It converts that signal to either a linear flow rate with a square root function, or you can get the pressure, DP pressure out directly and do it somewhere else. So this signal is then transmitted as a 4 to 20 milliamp, or sometimes as a Modbus or a Profibus signal, and you can read the signal out on the uh, optional local display. The receiver is responsible for interpreting what that 4 to 20 milliamps or the Profibus or the Modbus means. What you get in the end is a flow measurement that's used in control loops. It's very prominently used in the oil and gas uh, industry and, in, and for large pipes of any diameter uh, because it's ideal for that kind of measurement. It's all based upon math done by a guy by the name of Bernoulli uh, centuries ago, one of those dead white guys that we don't really have to worry about because other people take care of the math. The pressure drop, there's two uh, pressure drops you have to be concerned with. The instantaneous DP is what's actually used for calculating the flow rate. And that's from the, on this diagram up here, it's from the inlet pressure to the very bottom down there, that's the DP. But after the fluid flows through the primary flow element, which is the orifice plate is shown here, it recovers some of that pressure drop and we have a PPL or a permanent pressure loss. And that's the inlet pressure minus that recovered outlet pressure. This PPL is very important in the industry because a lot of people care about it. The permanent pressure loss uses up energy that's there in order to transfer liquid through the pipe. You need energy, either electrically or either electricity or steam heat that drives pumps or compressors to move the liquid through the pipes. This is the kinetic energy that creates the differential pressure that moves this liquid from point A to point B. As a uh, commonly uh, cited statistic is that 40% of the energy in the U.S. is used to either pump or compress fluid and move it through pipes. That can be lifting water into a standpipe, it can be running oil through an oil pipeline, it's used in factories as pneumatic fluid power, refineries use it to pump all the hydrocarbons from point A to point B as they do the refining process. The typical 20 horsepower motor can cost $50,000 a year in energy costs when you're running it 24-7. And you, you, you're paying all that money, or the customers and the users are paying all that money in order to pump liquid. So they want to minimize the loss of pressure, which is permanent pressure loss, which is inherent in measuring, because you don't want to spend all that money to pump fluid and have a lot of it lost in the measurement. So the lower the permanent pressure loss, the more efficient the energy usage is. The permanent pressure loss in orifice plates is really defined by the beta ratio that's in use. Over here on our diagram, we see that we have the bore size is the little d, and the, the diameter or the pipe size is the capital D there. A low beta ratio is a small hole, which has a higher DP, and therefore a higher permanent pressure loss, and it costs more to run a low beta ratio than it does a high beta ratio because you're losing more of that energy across the orifice plate as a permanent pressure loss. Every permanent or every primary flow element has a basic characteristic PPL or permanent pressure loss, which is unrecoverable pressure. The rule of thumb is that orifice plates have a permanent pressure drop of about 50%, as you can see in the little table down there, where a 100% inch water column drop at the pressure taps is about a 50, 50 inch water column permanent uh, pressure loss. And again, the people who pay the money to pump this fluid and are paying for the energy, they don't want to lose that energy in measurement. So permanent pressure loss is a big deal. Here's the chart that shows different permanent pressure losses at different beta ratios for different primary flow elements. Notice over here on this side, this is actually normalized uh, pressure loss. So 1 is 100 percent, 0.5 is 50 percent. Down here we have the beta ratios. Notice that the orifice plate is at the top of the scale with the highest permanent pressure loss. Then down here we have some that are 
Molos tubes, typically some version of a Venturi, short cone or long cone Venturis. So the Venturi, by definition, is a more efficient primary flow element than an orifice plate is. Another aspect of DP is turndown. Turndown defines over what range the meter reads accurately enough to be, actually be able to use. It also says how low can you get a reading before the error on that reading is so big that the reading is actually garbage. Well, we calculate it by the little formula right here. We take the full scale flow and divide it by the minimum flow at which the accuracy is still suitable, and we get this turndown ratio. All primary flow elements are by definition what they call percent of full scale instruments. They are not percent of reading instruments. So all percent of full scale instruments are very accurate at the top end of the range, but that accuracy drops off dramatically as you go towards the bottom end of the flow range. An example down here is 0 to 250 gallons per minute. If you have a half percent uncertainty, the error at the top end is one and a quarter gallons per minute which is not bad on, you know, 250 gallons per minute. But at the low end, if we take an example of 10 gallons per minute, that same error of 1.25 gallons per minute, that number is 12.5% of that number. That's usually an error level that's unacceptable for most people. It's just inaccurate enough that they don't want to use it. Technology advances have actually increased the available turndown for DP in two aspects. One is that there's some they in the by combining flow elements they get a pro flow pro, excuse me a flow profile that can actually be used over a wider range two examples are the accelerobar which is a pitot tube inside of a flow nozzle and then also FTI's HHR flow tubes and flow packs are very specially designed venturis with rounded edges that will give somewhere easily up to 10 to 1 sometimes as high as 20 to 1 turndown range the other thing that's contributed to the better turndown is that smart transmitters are far more stable at the low end readings, and also multivariables are compensating for line pressure and temperature, which adds to the fact that you just get better turndown with primary flow elements. Here's an example of that uh, accelerobar. It's an integrated flow nozzle. This part right here is the flow nozzle, there and there, and then the pitot tube is in there. Pitot tubes inherently are a very low pressure drop device. So you put that low pressure drop device for the pitot tube in there and you condition the flow with this flow nozzle and suddenly you've got something that has no downstream and no upstream installation requirements and you get very low permanent pressure drop which is one of those goals that you're trying to reach when you're reducing your energy costs. Vika or fluidic techniques HHR flow element, you can look at it up here, most people look at that and say, oh, that looks like a Venturi, and it is, it's a modified Venturi, it's a Venturi on steroids. It has relatively low pressure, permanent pressure loss down in the 15 to 20 percent range, and they've got a great little chart here that shows for a 16 inch airline or for a 24 inch steam line at a given beta, if you're going to run this thing 24-7, it compares what it would cost to make the measurement with the orifice plate, flow nozzle, venturi, or the flow tube. And you can see over here, using some standard uh, uh, cost measurement factor, that the flow tubes are far less costly to run because they have lower permanent pressure losses. They're down here in this low loss tube region of the uh, chart. The HHR flow pack is the similar to the one that we saw over here. There's the basic uh, flow element, but when you stick this part right here, that plate with all the holes in it, they call that a translineal flow plate, and it's a, it's a typical uh, flow conditioning plate with lots of holes in it. When you stick that upstream so that it profiles the flow, then you get incredibly high accuracies, half percent uncalibrated accuracy. It can actually be calibrated to a quarter percent on a flow stand, these are line sizes 3 to 36 inch, which is pretty typical for these kinds of tubes. The rule of thumb here is that in order to stick it in the pipe, you've got to have 5 to 6 times the line size. So a 3 inch line size, the tube would be about 18 inches long. This thing runs $800 to $1,000 per uh, diameter pipe inch to uh, put it in place there. A nice comparison is to see that if you were to, in a 2 inch line, this unit would take up 20 inches of line space. That's less than two feet, costs about $1,800. If you get a two-inch orifice plate with the flange unions 
and the meter run, that whole thing is about five feet long and it's eighteen hundred dollars. So they both cost about the same, but here you've got the meter run is five feet long and the uh, HHR flow pack element is only 20 inches long. That makes a huge difference in where people can actually use this thing because a lot of people don't have five feet of pipe in order to insert it to get the meter run and the upstream downstream requirements in order to get an accurate measurement. It has a very high coefficient of discharge which is where its accuracy statement comes from. The closer to 1.00 you have for a coefficient of discharge the more accurate the reading and this is up at the point 95.96 range. This actually fits WICA's pattern that they want to be a, a competitor at the top end of what are generally considered commodity markets. And DP flow elements have been out there for over 100 years now. The orifice plate is a well-established uh, flow element. They are literally commodities, but here's something that you can put in. It's, it's as a modified Venturi or as an advanced Venturi that has no upstream, no downstream, and has very uh, low permanent pressure loss at a very attractive cost for larger line sizes. It's definitely worth pursuing something like a 24 inch flow element. One question by the way that comes up in doing this is what happens when you want to get a higher velocity because of the pipe size you get a relatively low velocity they will machine these so that you can have the same line size unit but they'll machine it so that they have a smaller tube internally to get the velocity increase needed for good readings. So you get the smaller beta in a larger line size and it makes installation a whole lot easier. You don't have to have reducers or oddball piping in it. Let's look at the measurement advances that have come up in the past 20 years here. We got the multivariable transmitter which does pressure and temperature compensation for gases and steams. And that essentially gives you an inferred mass flow measurement. It's a DP transmitter, this part right here, that you connect with an RTD or a uh, thermocouple temperature sensor. You can see it wired in there. And they put some uh, math calculations in there so that you get out of this rather than volumetric flow and inferred mass flow. But the question comes up, why do you need temperature and pressure compensation? Well, all of these DP devices are essentially designed to what they call design conditions. The design conditions are the supposed operational conditions at which this primary flow element is going to operate. So there's a temperature, there's an operating temperature, there's an operating pressure, operating viscosity and density. And all four of those data points are used for sizing the orifice plate or for sizing whatever the primary flow element is in order to get a given flow rate producing a given DP drop so that the whole thing operates as a system. Well, gas is compressible unlike liquids, which for practical purposes and for the sake of process flow measurement are not compressible. And because they're compressible, that creates issues. Because guess how often the design conditions are actually met under real operational conditions. Sometimes they are, but more frequently they are not. They do not match reality. Here's an example of what happens when we deviate temperature from the operational design condition point. The design condition point was 60 degrees F. So we can see over here that we have zero error when the operating temperature is actually at 60 degrees F. If we drop off 10 degrees F down to 50, we come over here and we see that we got approximately negative 2.5% error. If we drop another 10 degrees, we're at about negative 4% error. And then you can see it drops down and it either goes up or down depending on whether the temperature goes up or down. But you can see that's quite a change in accuracy for a change in temperature. Same thing happens when the pressure deviates. You can read on the different lines here. Here's the percentage of error and it can get quite high as you can see here running up to 35 or 40 percent for a given pressure difference from what the design pressure is. So this gets down to the principle that mass accounts for density but volume does not. All of you had a chemistry class at one time or another, and in that chemistry class they went over Avogadro's number, 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd, which is the actual number of molecules in a mole. mole. We're not talking about mole whacker up here. That's a game that kids play. We're talking about mole, which is a quantity of actual molecules, a given set of molecules, which is very important for chemists or, that need to, or chem engineers that need to calculate how much stuff is needed to create the right process 
conditions in order to create a product. So if you got too few or too many moles, you're going to have a product or process problem. When you get exactly the right number, then you get a good product. As the volume and density varies, the mass actually varies. Gas and steam density varies with temperature and pressure. Therefore, we have deviation from design conditions, which actually produce an error. And all of this, when you come out with it, says that if you're doing volumetric measurements and you're trying to get mass out of it, that any temperature or pressure change is going to radically affect the measurement that you're making and therefore will affect the end product. The multivariable transmitter fixes that. The temperature changes can be recorded on this and therefore compensate for density changes in liquid and it's dynamite for the use with steam and gases because now you have both temperature and pressure deviations being compensated for in the final mass flow calculation. And down here people have asked me why I say where to use it, steam and gas and steam and gas and steam and gas. That's because I like to tell people where you use it or where what I'm going to tell them. Actually tell them that and then repeat what I told them. So it's use it for steam and gases, steam and gases, steam and gases. That's an excellent application for multivariable transmitter, transmitter because you get compensation for pressure and temperature deviations. Let's look at the volumetric versus standard volume versus mass calculations. DP by itself, for the first 80 years of its history, was strictly a volumetric measurement. I, well, I shouldn't say that. You can, people always could put a temperature transmitter on there and an absolute pressure transmitter and get static pressure, stick that all, or run all those signals into a flow computer and actually create a mass flow calculation. But that's exactly what the multivariable transmitter does now. It replaces the flow or the flow computer with a single transmitter because it's taking the uh, measurements needed and doing the calculations that are needed. So the multivariable can actually measure standardized flow. Ordinarily we have liters per minute or cubic feet per minute for a volumetric measurement and some people will call that a mass measurement. They'll say I got pounds per hour of steam but that really only applies when the steam is at design conditions. The multivariable by measuring temperature and, and line pressure can give you a standard cubic foot per measurement or it's actually a standard measurement corrected to standard temperature and pressure, STP. The multivariable infers a mass flow measurement which is pounds per hour of steam or liquid, kilograms per minute, pounds per hour, those kinds of units are used for mass flow measurements. A primary example of where mass measurement makes a difference where we uh, have dealt with this was in a steel mill where they were ratioing two gas flows. And they were using a 20-year-old control scheme where they had basic DP volumetric flow measurements. They were doing the ratio with these two volumetric measurements. They were constantly adjusting flow rates, tweaking them day by day and from, from daytime to nighttime due to temperature deviations because the volumetric was working on design conditions and the changing temperatures between daytime and nighttime or seasonally so much affected the mass that they had to make these tweak adjustments all the time. The solution for this was to do mass flow measurements with a multivariable. They put it in there. They're always calculating an effect mass, which is moles, and the end process is it works. So the question is, why do people still use DP rather than the other alternatives in all of these different flow technologies? And the answer is, well, it works where other technologies don't. There are magnetic flow meters, very accurate when you use them with water, but water is conductive, the medium has to be conductive, hydrocarbons are not, and you can't use a magnetic flow meter with steam, it just won't take the heat. With vortex, the medium has to be clean and relatively low viscosity. They will work up to 465 degrees F. They will work on steam, but you get something that's dirty or high viscosity, won't work at all. Turbines need to be clean, and they also have lubricity issues because they got bearings in them. The uh, viscosity and the density limits are, are stated for turbine. They do like cold, but again, you can't use them on steam. Thermal dispersion me meters are typically gas only. They can do liquids but they're limited to lower temperatures, even though they're, they claim they're temperature compensated. They work best at lower temperatures. They don't do steam, and they, it has to be a dry medium. You get one liquid drop on a thermal dispersion meter, and you get a spike in the reading because the heat 
from the thermal dispersion unit is trying to evaporate that liquid instead of measure what the gas flow is at that point. So liquid droplets are killers in uh, gas measurement for thermal dispersion. Positive displacement, media specific, you can't do steam. They're limited in their line sizes. They're generally for smaller line sizes. Ultrasonic clamp-on has temperature limits. They don't do steam. If they do gases, they have very, relatively high minimum uh, line pressures for gases. Coriolis, again, does not do steam. Larger line sizes are prohibitively expensive. I think at the current moment, I, I know they have 10-inch Coriolis meters, and they might have 12-inch, but they're, they don't go bigger than that. So there's a line size limitation for Coriolis. So where does DP shine? Well, it really shines at high temperatures. That's when other technologies just can't take the heat in the kitchen. Steam, high temperature liquids, dowel therm, heat transfer medium, these are the kinds of places where you see DP used all the time. When it's a hot process, the reason it works is the long impulse tubing drops the temperature of the medium going down to the DP transmitter. It's a deadheaded uh, situation, so there's no flow in those impulse lines. It keeps it cool, and it can, a DP will last a long time in a properly installed hot process with long uh, impulse lines. It works at pressures up to the transmitter body ratings, uh, temperature adjusted. Typically, uh, most of the ones we deal with are 4,500 PSI up to 260 degrees F, and then there are derating curves above 260. Large line sizes, there is no such thing as a 24-inch Coriolis meter, so you've got to look at what you can actually use in a given flow situation that you can make a, make a measurement with. Uh, multivariable does a dynamite job of doing temperature and pressure compensation for gases and steam. That's one reason it shines. Uh, installation, there is a hot top, hot, excuse me, hot tap option when you're using an averaging pitot tube so that you don't actually have, have to shut the line down. Uh, you can get the tube in and uh, take readings almost immediately. There is a huge knowledge base out there from 90 to 100 years of use of orifice plates. So it's generally in people's comfort zone. It's been around for a long time. People understand how to install it and how to maintain it. There are some downsides to it. It has a relatively low turndown if you do not use these advanced primary flow elements that we talked about before, like the Accelibar or the uh, Flow Pack. They're generally not good for very low velocity or low flows. They do not deal well with low Reynolds numbers uh, flows. There's always some pressure loss, and there's always some you know, fraction of that that's the permanent pressure loss. The measurement is affected by changes in density and viscosity pressure and temperature for gases and steam, that's just inherent in it. It does have fairly uh, lengthy straight run requirements up and downstream, particularly for custody transfer, with the exception of the advanced primary flow elements, which are zero up and zero down. One thing that a guy pointed out to me once is that when you use a DP flow meter or a multivariable, there's no integral uh, totalizer in the meter. And I never stopped to think about it before, but most of the other flow meters, there is a totalizer in the flow meter itself. Here you got to send out the flow rate to some other device and have it totalized in a totalizer. There is some maintenance required with primary flow elements. Some can be damaged. Uh, orifice plates, edges can be rounded off or, or uh, damaged. Impulse tubes can leak. Uh, Three-volt manifolds, can uh, the scale can clog the ports, or those kinds of things can come up there. So there is uh, maintenance to consider on that. But in summary, DP flow is alive and well in the 21st century. It holds its own amongst all the other flow technologies out there as long as it makes sense for the temperatures and pressures that you're working with and the, and the uh, medium itself. Uh, there are the advanced technology primary flow elements out there with the lower permanent pressure loss, much greater turndown, and the zero up, zero down installation requirements. By the time you tie those primary flow elements to a multivariable transmitter, you can really get a great mass flow measurement that works for people in their process. That's the end of the presentation. Thank you for attending today. Feel free to call Lesman and ask for Dan if you have any questions on this.